Hey guys, how are you doing? This is Ed from Z Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I'm back to see a good buddy of mine, Lee Stoffer. Lee, how are you doing? I'm good, mate. Good. So I appreciate you having me down for the day. That's it. Um, you're paying rent soon, aren't you? I know, I know. <laughs> I'm going to move my furniture in soon. <laughs> So the reason why I'm down to see Lee today is basically we're filming a video on chip carving. Now chip carving crazily is a subject I've not covered on my channel in all these years. Uh, as I was really eager, I've been receiving a lot of requests from some of you guys to say, Zed, can you cover the topic, okay? So I thought to myself straight away, I need the first guy I'm gonna to speak to to do chip carving, that's Lee. <laughs> Lee's a real dab hand. If you're not familiar with Lee, it's the first time you're watching uh, one of my videos. Uh, Lee's a very good friend of mine and also my mentor when it comes to green woodworking. Known Lee for many years, he's a very accomplished at what he does. He's an accomplished green woodworker as well as a tool handler and maker. Now, Lee has been accomplished at chip carving for quite some time, haven't you? I've had a little dabble, yeah. Yeah, he's, <laughs> he's been hum once or twice. He's been humble. Um, so Lee's very proficient when it comes to chip carving. He's also taught it at events as well across the UK. So what we're to be doing in this video is we're going to be it, it, treat, treat it like a beginner's guide. Imagine you're not familiar with chip carving at all, or you've never done it, or you may have attempted to dabble in it here and there. What this tutorial is really designed to do is give you a foundation, okay, a solid foundation. So we're going to look at some examples of chip carving just in case you're not familiar with what it is. Uh, we're then going to look at you know, the ideal knife, the use format, some of the things you're going to need, and then we're going to work through there. So would you say that's a kind of fair thing to say? To yeah. kind of give it grounded. Uh, yeah. And chip carving. So that's what we're going to do in this video. So what we're going to do is we're going to first of all look at some examples of chip carving itself. Um, the final thing I do want to stress is that um, there is a timestamp at the bottom of this video. So if you scroll your kind of uh, mouse over that or kind of your trackpad, however you're watching this, what you're going to be able to see is this video is actually broken up into sections. So what this video is designed to do is be like a tutorial, okay? You can jump to particular sections uh, when you move forward and incorporate what Lee's going to teach you in this video into whatever it is you're going to carve. So Lee, with your kind permission, I think we'll begin. Let's go for it. Guys, hope you enjoy the rest of this video. Right, so I've got a little bit of a selection here. Apologies for any background noise you might be hearing. I've got a neighbour that's doing a bit of work on his shed, so he's right behind us, and we might hear a little bit of what he's up to. But what we've got here is a selection of spoons, some of which I've carved, um, some of which have been carved by other people. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about the different styles, really. Um, going back to probably one of the first people's work that I was became aware of um, was this guy here in the middle, um, Simon Hill. And this was at one of the spoon, the first spoon fest, in fact, that I met Simon. We'd spoke a bit in advance. He was doing a blog at the time and he was doing this style very much in a in a Swedish style. Um, so this is a, a Vila Sundquist that has got a little bit of incised chip carving on it. This was done you know, quite late in his life and he's done more intricate designs in the past, but probably part of what influenced Simon was, I guess, his general style of carving. And then Magnus Sundlin was another guy at the time who was actually doing some before I'd really kind of dipped a toe in it. So these are those three are kind of the guys that have really, I suppose, inspired me to, to give it a try. Um, and then there's one here by a friend of mine called Nigel Leach. That's really quite a nice involved pattern, which is, so it's it's definitely chip carving of a sort. So there's different types, really, I would say, of chip carving. This is very much what I'd call incised work. So it's really lines that are drawn with a knife, but material's been removed, which differs from coal rosing, where you're basically just opening the fibers of the wood up and then rubbing in a die. Um, with chip carving, you're removing a chip. Now, the, the size and shape of those chips is what varies. So this is where I really started with chip carving, I wanted to try and replicate a little bit of nature, so I tried feathers. So again, it's just mostly incised work, apart from the kind of chips on the perimeter of the handle. This one next to it is actually where I've carved into a crook. What I've done is to just accentuate the lines of the grain in the wood by incising those with a knife, um, and obviously creating a border to kind of contain that. Then when you get 
a little bit more complicated you get these kind of styles with so like this one you've got some incised lines but there's also some triangular chips been removed uh, this one again similar but you've got triangular chips which I would call pyramid chips and then on the edge you've got what I would call flat chips now I don't know if these are official terminologies because I only ever read one book about chip carving by a guy called Wayne Barton and it was a good book and it talked about the kind of tools that you need and some of the techniques which I quickly found none of which really applied to spoons they were all working on much bigger pieces of wood where you could put your hand down as a reference use your use a knife in a certain way using your thumb as a kind of a guide and in practicality I found when I tried to transfer those techniques to spoon carving it, it didn't really work for me I mean what we were talking about really was typically knives of this kind of size which I did make for myself but before I even bothered to put a handle on it I realized it's just massive for the job at hand so I've then got around to making myself much smaller versions you can see by comparison there and even this is really a bit bigger than we need for spoons in a way this is my favorite one um, and I'm going to talk a bit about the, the way the bevels are ground on these knives in a minute but there's one thing they all share in common they're at different angles but basically they want to be this is called a sheep's foot design and this is the kind of knife that's going to be used to, to cut the triangular chips um, and then you're going to need a kind of a pointier blade to do the incised work so if we focus on these for a minute I've got a selection of these that I've made based on the fact that I carve in different types of wood and the finer the blade is, the better. So we want this quite a strong point. So the edge is the straight part, the curve is the spine. What's important is that the knife is ground from the spine all the way down to the edge in one flat plane. If we have a micro bevel on this tool, like for example, you would have on something like a utility knife blade, you can see we've got a flat section and then a a bevel so this is a nice thin blade it's agile and it will get into the cut what happens is with these micro bevels is as soon as that shoulder becomes engaged in the depth of the chip it wants to push the point away from what ultimately wants to be the bottom of a of a pyramid chip what I would call a pyramid chip anyway an inverted triangular chip that's been taken out of the wood so that's where you need this kind of sheep's foot style of blade and they'll come from various manufacturers with different degrees of crank from the actual handle to the edge some of them cranked as much as kind of 45 degrees down again it's going to be personal preference what you what you prefer i found from the way i do this you don't need any you know any more than what is kind of there which is probably more like 15 maybe 20 degrees of crank down from the handle um, but like i say the difference being is if you look at the my three sort of go-to chip carving knives at the moment for triangular chips are these three so if you look at the thickness of the spine they're progressively thinner but they're all a similar distance from the spine to the edge and then effectively what that gives us is a different inclusive bevel angle now these are much finer than you would find on a traditional carving knife um, so if you're looking at your average carving knife you're maybe going to be talking about an inclusive bevel angle so basically where the, the shape of the triangle that makes the edge is going to be somewhere around 25 degrees now with these chip carving knives that I prefer to use this really fine one is literally half of that which makes it incredibly weak in terms of its strength you could easily put the point in and if you try to turn it it's going to snap but what it does do is when you just push it into the wood is it penetrates very well very quickly without much resistance but there's certain timbers that that's going to be just too fine and too delicate for on harder woods so on stuff like birch willow that'll work a treat go for something a bit harder like a cherry a fruit wood a sycamore something like that you're going to need a slightly steeper angle so those knives that i've got there vary from about 12 degrees through to about 18 degrees and that really i think anything more than 20 becomes difficult to use so what about the normal carving knives like the Moro 106 etc are they yeah. fine to use no well some people do i think they're crazy personally but that's a matter of personal preference if you notice they've got a curved tip and if we want to get straight into a chip we need that to be straight now it's very close to the end it's straight enough but it's also very pointy 
so a little bit weak so you've kind of almost got to wiggle it in the cut to make it work you're still liable to damage it it's still quite for this job I'd say quite a steep bevel angle but more importantly if you're holding on to the handle of the blade you are miles away from where you're going to be working so you're not going to be very accurate I think some people will either tape up the blade off some people just holding on to the blade like this now granted this isn't a standard more handle and it's much longer than they normally would be but it's still an enormous amount of weight out the back when you're holding on to the tip that's just throwing you off balance so I think personally I say if you've got the one knife by all means use it I, if I had to make a choice between chip carving with that or that I would choose the utility knife because I, I just genuinely think it's probably more suitable I can hold the blade much closer hold the handle much closer to the blade and hold it a bit like a, a pen that you would draw with and be a mu much closer to the edge say the downside is that that bevel is going to want to push the the edge away from the bottom of a cut but you know like this practice stick for example I did it as a challenge to see what you could do with a utility blade and all of those chips were carved with this knife so it is possible but I think personal preference you're much better off with a dedicated chip carving knife even if it's a big one like this you could always sort of choke up on the handle come right down onto the tang of the blade to grip it and still get where you want to for spoon carve, you know, for chip carving on spoons. And that's specifically what we're talking about today. So one last question about the tools for those watching yeah. who don't have a chip carving knife. Yeah. Is there a particular one that you recommend or? I've made all my own because I didn't really find anything out there. I bought a cheap one, which was kind of this style to begin with. There, I think, you know, there are plenty of makers that make them, but I couldn't actually vouch for it because I haven't used them. I, I approached this from an angle that they were quite small little fun knives to make, quite simple. So that's what I did. I just made them and experimented with them and I've, I've stuck with the ones that I've made because they work for me. Um, maybe, you know, maybe one day I'll get around to making some that I'll make available for sale, but that's, that's something that's possibly in the future. But yeah, if you look around, I, what I would say is try and find something that's fairly small and appropriate for the job that you're going to do, which, you know, for me, chip carving on spoons you're going to want a small one what the other thing you're going to want is a pointy knife now this is where actually the tip of a, the 106 is fine because when you look at those two in comparison they're basically the same thing all right the beauty of this knife is it's just the tip and i can hold it really close so when it comes to doing like lines chip carving lines if i want to follow a line i can get much closer to the actual tip of the knife and get i would say superior control over it in doing so if you've got all that extra weight of the handle and you're gripping onto the blade like this i just think it's more likely that it's going to want to steer itself and obviously there's always the option unless you have taped it up that you might cut yourself in holding onto it and it's certainly going to be uncomfortable to pinch that sort of thin steel for any long periods of time in my opinion but again it's just a matter of opinion if you needed to do anything with this i'd say your best place to start would be this kind of this incised work so these fairly fine decorative cuts that are just lines so effectively you're just taking a v cut that's where your pointy blade is going to come in but i used i use this tiny one which is actually um it's a very well used so it's lost most of its clip now this is a nick, nick westerman clip point um, but this has been used and sharpened extensively so it's a lot shorter and it has a lot less clip than it did to begin with in fact I think I've got a, a fresher one I'll perhaps get you out I'll perhaps get out in a minute and show you the difference between a well used one and one that's fairly fresh out of the box but they're certainly good for the for the incised work right so the first thing I would recommend once you've decided on what tools you're going to use if you've got a nice spoon that you've carved then you could destroy it by getting the chip carving wrong <laughs> especially if you've carved the handle down in its finished dimensions and you decide you don't like it and there's not enough material left to remove it so we're going to put the spoon aside for a minute because i would strongly recommend practicing with practice sticks so these can be ones that you've prepared with a knife or with a hand plane in, in this case so you've got a nice smooth structured square surface that you can work with and you can practice you know you could, if you wanted to you could draw the shape of a spoon handle on and work out a design on it you can try out you know various patterns this is um, silver birch 
willow, lime, they're all good ones. This is willow, but looking at the difference, this is a bit spalted. As much as it's perfectly good for the job, this spalting is gonna dis distract you from what you're trying to achieve. So you want something that's fairly clean, straight grained, um, and isn't gonna confuse your eyes and take away from the design that you're trying to make. Um, so what we're gonna do is look at some basics first, and the most basic form of chip that I can really think of um, for a beginner to start trying is probably these, what I would call flat chips. So they're different from a pyramid chip in as much as they're only really on two planes, as in you've not got three angles converging in the center. But what you need for this ideally is a beveled edge. So the first thing we will do is we'll work with this press practice stick. Put these ones to one side. And the first thing I want to do is bevel this edge. So I'm going to come in here with a slightly bigger knife and then bevel this edge back. We might need to go this way, depending on what way the grain's going. But we want to bevel back to this line that I've drawn here at a bit of an angle. It doesn't have to be much, but it wants to give us somewhere to go with the chip. In fact, I'll just hold that like this. What you could do is also draw a line down this side to make sure you're coming down to the same distance. This wants to be a reasonably flat surface that we're working on here. So it's worth taking a little bit of time just to prepare it. So it works well on the edge of a on the edge of a spoon handle to have a bit of a a bit of a bevel on it. Um, this is basically what we're going to be aiming for is to put these flat chips in and you can see the way I've achieved that is to bevel these edges of that handle back very slightly which is what we've just done here now. So we've got that bevel working for us. Let's just come in and finish it off there as if it was breaking into the end part of the handle of a spoon. Clean that up a tiny bit. Right, so I've followed this line along now. So now we can mark out. And this is where you're actually just gonna want a nice sharp pencil. You could sharpen it with your knife. I actually still find that the old fashioned rotary pencil sharpeners give me the best result. And what we're gonna do is take that angle and just try and make this, these chips fairly even. Now these are gonna be quite big chips. The bigger the chip, in a way, the harder it is, but we're gonna keep it fairly simple. If you can see, I'm just trying to make these uniform. You could go to the bother of kind of measuring, dividing this up. I generally just eyeball it. I'm not saying that's a right or a wrong way of doing it. It's just the way I've kind of always done it. So if your eyes work reasonably well in coordination with your fingers, you should get on an okay with this. So we're just trying to keep these reasonably uniform. And we'll just take it to there. Okay. Now, the trick with this is you are going to want one of these sheep's foot type blades. And in a way, the beauty of doing it with this on a practice stick is we've got a nice flat surface to bear on. On a spoon, you might find you want to kind of prop it up on something to work on it. But let's just make a start. And we've got this nice straight edge here to work with. So we're going to put the point of the knife in at the point of the triangle and just basically press it down. And this is where I've found that if the knife is too cranked, you're going to put the point in, but not hit this edge without really elevating the work. With this, I can do it just off the edge of the table and get the, the blade. So it's going in where I've put this bevel in. I'm just wanting to hit the edge on the outside and then I want it to cut down into the point on the inside. So I'm just putting downwards pressure, no leverage, nothing and what let's just take one out for good measure and then I'll show you the approach I would normally take so we're going to come in from the, this corner turning the knife horizontal now slice in and what should happen is we get to the back and that chip just lifts out and we've actually described that as a nice flat chip now what I would generally do when I get into the flow of this is once I've marked out go along and put all of the downward cuts in one direction so you've not got to change the orientation of the knife and how you hold it is entirely up to what feels most comfortable 
again, I'm just putting downwards pressure on, so the point of the knife's going in, I'm actually holding the handle in this hand. This handle's very experimental, by the way. I never did get around to upgrading it, because it works okay. It's just a piece of dowel, basically, with a blade jammed in the end of it. But for this type of knife, you're not carving with it in the same way that you need this really ergonomic handle shape. So I've done all of this direction coming down. Now I'm going to do all of this direction coming down the other way. And I think it's best to do this because you're going to build up a little bit of muscle memory of each individual cut as you go along doing it in the same direction and you're more likely to create a uniform pattern and put about a similar amount of pressure when you do it this way. So we're just pushing down. At this point I just remembered I'm going to put some glasses on because my eyesight is uh, starting to make this a bit more difficult than it used to be. So I'm just going to come in from the side again and we're just wanting to come down this line and press it in at an angle so that basically the edge ends up against that wall that we've cut down into and then that chip should just lift out, just miss getting right into the point there. So that was all it was. So again, this is probably the most difficult cut of the three because we're slicing. Grain direction might come into play, but you'll find once you get a certain amount of progress, see that broke out a little bit, I must have angled the knife so that I cut slightly deeper into the chip than I had done with the first cuts. So that could be potentially a problem if it was on a spoon but we could potentially go along and deepen the other chips to match it and clean that one up. But we're just going to come in. The knife wants to be obviously nice and sharp for this. And we'll look at that process in a moment. Obviously didn't cut quite deep enough there. But that didn't come out then. And it's worth, you know, just paying attention at this point to how this how this feels and how it goes down. Don't be tempted with these knives to really try and lever the chip out with the point of the knife. It's fine to just sort of like lift it out like that without putting too much pressure on. But if we really try and bend it in the cut, we're more likely to break the knife than lift the chip out. So we just go along and make that pattern all the way along there. So that is what I would consider your starting point is these flat chips. Right, so the next thing I want to look at is pyramid chips. So in these areas that we haven't carved, but we've kind of described with the flat chips, I'm just going to come along and do a little border inside the existing cuts. And again, even with the pencil, probably worth doing all of the lines in one direction first, and then come back at it from the other. And I'm just using the line that describe the top of the bevel as the back stop for these ones. So these are going to be slightly smaller triangles. And again, the lines are going to be a, a guide. What I want to do ideally is remove all of the pencil by making the chip cut. So a pyramid chip is slightly different in the way that we're going to take it out. If we think about it how it is, you, if you draw the triangle, like so, what we're going to aim for is a point right in the middle. So we want to create three facets that converge at that point. So that point in the middle is deeper than the surrounding area. So each one of these little triangles is an independent face of the timber. So looking at it like this, the grain direction is like this. And I always find the last cut that you make wants to either go with or directly across the grain, wherever, wherever possible. So the first cut I'm going to make is to start at this point and draw the knife in and down towards this point. So what I want is the, the tip of the knife to finish right in the center of each triangle, right? From all three cuts. So I'm gonna come in from this edge and just basically, if this is vertical, I'm angling the knife back somewhere between 30 and 45 degrees, I guess. So the tip starts there. I'm just gonna push the blade in 
there's little res there's very little resistance it's such a fine blade but then again I can't put any kind of levering force on this I've just got to pop it straight back out again same again with the next one keep it the same keep this cut so I'm cutting away from the point that's perpendicular to the grain towards the grain direction if that makes sense and what I'm aiming to do is for the point the tip of the blade if you imagine when I'm in there the tip of the blade is kind of hitting the spot in the center So just pressing it in very little pressure needed for this the wider and thicker the bevel on the knife the harder work this is going to be so then rather than work around the corner with the knife I'm going to move the wood round come back at it from this direction so it's exactly the same cut except this time I'm cutting towards the point I've just cut away from but it's exactly the same cut and what you should find is when you when you meet your your first cut you should feel it just the knife just naturally drops into that point and you get a little bit less resistance so you have to when you're approaching the end of this cut you have to kind of back off a little bit on the pressure and just let it kind of drop into the pre-existing almost like the stop cut that you've made with this first cut so I'm just going to push in aiming for the center of that triangle again and then the release what I would call the release cut is going to be made with the grain so we want to follow from this point to this point so it's basically the same cut pushing into the middle but this is going to be easier because we're going with the grain this is why I leave this one till last it's dead easy to like overdo it if we've already made the release we've already made the initial cuts the release cuts the really easy one and then we can see what we get out hopefully is this tiny little pyramid so we can see it there the three faces on the chip and ideally these want to come out in one go so again there's the next one so we go all the way along again muscle memory plays a part that one's been a little bit resistant so we'll work out why in a moment just stay with the same direction of cut and they say they'll generally just flake out like this I try and not be tempted to use a knife too much I'll turn it around and use a spine just to flick them away so that it keeps the tip nice and safe and sharp but there we go that one's been a bit stubborn so it probably means one of the previous cuts didn't quite find its mark and there you go it just needed a little bit more in that direction so then we've got those pyramid chips removed at that point it's probably worth just using a normal rubber or a razor just to rub away any of the remaining pencil lines that we haven't cut off just to sort of reveal the design in its entirety sometimes a little paintbrush is quite useful there's a little bit of a chip holding on in there that got stuck on the flat chip okay so that's flat chips and pyramid chips and they work quite nicely in conjunction on a border feature like that I think so this triangle that I drew just to describe the process of cutting these now hopefully you can see how you get these three faces that are described in the picture this chip is twice the size of these it's as big as the the pyramid the flat chips I've put on the side now it's technically possible but kind of risky to try and cut that in the same three cuts so anything that I deem to be too big to take in three cuts I would take in six cuts now the way I do that is a combination of the two techniques so we're going to be pushing down finding that center point and pushing down with the knife so that we just find the center with the tip of the knife and the outside of the triangle with the edge okay so I just cut out to that point flip it round same again just pushing it down no sideways pressure no rocking or levering we're just trying to keep the angle the same for each cut so we make the same basically penetrate in the middle to the same point and we just want to touch the outside of the triangle with the edge so we basically cut slightly downhill into the middle so effectively what we've done is we've broken this big chip up into three individual pieces of timber which gives a little bit of room for the wood to move out the way of the blade when I'm coming in from the side again so now we've reversed this effectively we've got the grain still running the same direction so this flat side is across the grain basically both of these cuts are running on a diagonal to the grain so they're the cuts I'm going to make first so I'm going to go in at the point again 
push the knife down, aiming for that middle point, coming to this edge. Then I'm going to spin it round again, same again on the diagonal, coming to that edge. Right, but aiming for the middle. Now, as it's happening, they've started to break away already as two individual chips. The release cut now is made completely across the grain. It's a slightly harder one to make than it would be with the grain, but it's still completely across the grain rather than diagonally to it. So you've got a more uniform pressure being applied. And you can see those just missed the mark on that coming right to that corner. So I have to take a little trim chip there. But basically I've removed a bigger portion of material quite safely but to produce the same three facets that we made before. Now this one was slightly out of balance. I'm just going over it again, taking that little wafer. Again, I'd try and take the three cuts, make these three individual faces with single cuts where possible. If you have to sort of fettle it and tickle around a bit, you just then end up jabbing the point in places where you'd rather not. It can get a little bit scruffy, but that's, that's cleaned up okay. Again, just take the rubber, and the whole point of chip carving really is when you move something around, those different faces catch the light differently and, and sort of make the design stand out. So that's our basic triangular chips where we're gonna use a sheep's foot blade. Obviously there's hundreds if not thousands of different combinations of triangular patterns that you can make. Um, when you get a bit more experienced, you can start to extend and curve these triangular chips. So this is flat chips within flat chips with pyramid chips there and then these longer pyramid chips with the long points. So basically rather than just pushing the blade in you've got to start traveling with the blade. That gets a bit more complicated so for you know we're starting at the beginning here so keeping it fairly simple that's not a bad place and not a bad design to actually start with. So that are you know, these are you know, the basic triangular chips that would be made with this type of blade. Right, so let's assume we've got the basics and we can carve a few triangular chips now. The next job is to consider the incised chips. So basically thin slivers of material that have been removed by a, basically a V-cut that removes some material. So I showed you before this little well-used clip point. Just by way of comparison, this is one that's not been used so much, so you can see it's shrunk in length and it's lost some of the clip from the point, the clip being this kind of bite out of the spine. Um, partly, say so that's just due to wear and tear and sharpening, and they've got a very delicate point, so sooner or later you're gonna damage one of these knives just because they're so fine and delicate, but that's why they're good at what they do but you've got to accept that they're not going to like that point's not going to last forever. It's basically like a scalpel blade. Um, so this one has been sharpened several times and normally I would remove, if I damage the point, I don't mess about with the, the geometry of the actual bevel angle. I just rub the spine away until I got a point back. Hence why there's less clip on that blade than there is on the, the fresher one. But these blades are what comes in handy when you want to create borders and say patterns like this, patterns like this one. But you can basically, you're drawing with a knife. Um, so the difference between this and coal rosin, with coal rosin you literally do just drag a blade through which opens up the timber to squeeze some, um, some colorant in. With this we're actually just removing some material. So let's look at this spoon that's as yet to be carved. You notice that the bowl of this spoon hasn't been completely finished. When you're doing chip carving, um, invariably you're going to be holding onto this, probably getting it a bit sort of dirty, maybe catching it a bit with a with a pencil or a knife. So I generally just finish off the hollowing after I've done the chip carving of the handle. Um, just the way I do it, not essential, but if we want to make, say, a border, we're going to want to use the old finger gauge technique. So we've still got a nice sharp pencil and we're going to run a finger against like the edge of the spoon handle. And obviously now we're progressing. We've, we've assumed that we've done a bit of practice on some practice sticks. We've actually got a spoon that we want to decorate because there's, there's stuff that comes into this in terms of how to hold it. So first of all, let's just try and describe the design that we want to put on. So let's start with the basic border and let's break this handle up a little bit. We'll come down sort of two thirds of the length of the handle and then we'll come across 
just to divide it up a little bit and then we'll come back up the other side and again you can be as kind of fussy with this technique of design as you like. I would try not to sort of scribble and rub out too many times because the pencil being the sharpest this will leave a very slight dent in the wood so if you keep like drawing the design not being happy with it rubbing it out then you're going to end up basically having to recarve the surface of the wood to get rid of it. So again, if you, if you want to design something, um, right, I've got a plain practice stick here. If I wanted to practice the design for this particular spoon, obviously I could take the spoon itself, trace around the handle on the practice stick, then do the design, see what it looks like before I then commit to doing it on the spoon. Or you could just draw it on paper, transfer it across. Um, went slightly askew there so I'm just going to straighten that up a little bit. So now we've got a pencil line that basically wants to be removed and the, the material that's beneath that pencil line wants to be removed and that's where these pointy blades really come into their own. So we can come in with a really fine point here and again if we're thinking about this being vertical we want to rock the blade back probably around 30 degrees and the biggest tip that I could give anybody when it comes to this type of cut is I'm, you can probably see I'm holding the knife a bit like a pen so I'm gripping it with my fingers as if I'm going to draw with it it just makes it much more controllable than trying to hold it like you would conventionally and do something that controlled with it so I'm going to put the tip of the knife in there and rock it back and then I'm basically just going to follow that line on the outside of the pencil line is the idea and what is dead easy to do is if you focus on the actual tip of the blade, the chances are it's just going to go where it fancies and it's going to be drawn by the, the grain of the wood. And I could liken this to if you were driving down the road in your car and you spend too long looking out the window, you're probably going to end up in the hedge. So it's the same thing. What I want to do is be looking, if the point of the blade is here, I'm probably looking five or ten millimetres in front of the actual point of the blade and that's where naturally my brain and a little bit of hand-to-eye coordination is going to communicate that as well. that's where you want the knife to be so look where you want the blade to go not where it is or it will lead you astray so I've come down the outside of this okay now we're going to come across the bottom now because we're going across the grain I've basically been running with the grain going this way so to come across the grain here I want to press just a little bit harder to engage the tip put a little bit more pressure down to come across the grain to achieve the same depth of cut when you get to the edge you want to stop and maybe stand the knife up a little bit just to finish it to the pencil line. Same again, if you notice vertical, rock it back. Just draw that line, take your time, look in front of the blade. The more you practice this, the, sort of the quicker you'll be able to go. I'm sort of slowing this down just to try and show you that. Now I could have tried to come all the way around that curve but it's really difficult to kind of manipulate the spoon and the knife at the same time. Having this kind of cork surface to work on is quite good because it's a bit less slippy than the surface of the table. So now I'm just going to come around here and I'm going to turn the handle of the spoon slightly with my left hand whilst I'm drawing the curve with my right with the knife. And I'm just going to come around and try and meet up with the place where I started in the first place. Okay, so now what we've done is we've effectively cut the full perimeter in one direction so we've cut that V the outside angle all the way in so now we've got to do the reverse and come round again in the opposite direction and take these chips out so I'm going to start with the cross grain cut here so we've got a point and a point that we've started and finished on so I want to come the other side of the pencil line now and aim again if you imagine say the pencil line is as thick as my finger on the one hand I'm going to start on the edge and aim for the centre but at a given depth so we come from either side of the pencil line. So we've done the outside, we're going to come for the inside so coming inside the pencil line again rocking the knife back away from the cut so I can see the actual line and then just try and draw that line again and hopefully those two cuts meet in a middle point and what we get is this thin chip long thin chip that gets removed okay done that side now so come up this 
I've done the cross, sorry. So now I'm going to come up this side on the inside again, just rocking that angle back. And what you hopefully find is that if you get the depth of the cut right, this cut should be slightly easier than the first one because you've already kind of weakened the grain of the timber on the opposite side. So you should find that the tip of the blade is naturally drawn into that valley and wants to cut to the bottom. And hopefully, if you get it right, we've cut deep enough, you might have to go back over the odd bit. This should come out, somehow I've missed on the outside there. Right, there we go, just released it. We've got one long, thin chip. That's an ideal scenario. It doesn't matter if it comes out in two or three bits, it really doesn't. But once you've had a bit of practice, you should be able to achieve this. Again, take your time, practice on practice sticks before you commit to doing spoons. And if you notice the way I'm holding this, I'm putting my thumb under the bowl and I'm putting pressure down onto the neck of the spoon with a couple of fingers just to stop it from skidding around. What, might, what you might find helpful is to maybe elevate it a little bit so you've got the handle up off the bench just to give your fingers a little bit of room to move around underneath. You might be fine without that, depends how thick the handle is and you've got how much flexibility you've got in your fingers and your wrist. Just whatever feels the most comfortable. Just watching ahead of the blade again. And again, it looks like on the outside, I haven't quite cut deep enough. So just find that original cut. Just very gently, I'm tickling now, I'm hardly no pressure. I'm just basically running the knife through that cut again. And there's a couple of fibers that weren't quite released. Now we've got the probably the trickiest cut of all here. The outside cut isn't too bad. This inside cut cross the grain of an internal curve. I'm going to elevate it on a practice stick, just put my hand flat to pin this down and then I've got to work across myself which is really awkward so I might cover things up a bit from the camera's perspective but far better off to come around the outside to get my hand out the way and get my head right over what I'm doing now and come around and these are really difficult to do in one go but I'm going to try and come around here just a little bit at a time so I'm stopping to adjust the angle because it's really difficult to just flow around that bend. But then again, we've got one little curly chip out and we've now achieved a nice little border with a nice pointy little knife. I just want to quickly touch on some of the slightly more complicated things that we've done. And I also wanted to point out the reason why I didn't draw this design on in the first place. So I've drawn my border now in cutting that board, I'm going to be moving my hands around quite a lot on this surface. So if I'd have drawn all of this design on before I've cut my board up, all I'm going to do is end up smudging that pencil into the wood grain. So that can cause a problem. Um, what I'm going to look at here is doing some of these sort of elongated chips that travel a little bit. So you've basically got to decide how, where the deepest part of the chip's going to be. So now I'm going to draw in basically my cut lines just to give me a, an idea. So this is the shape that I want to remove and these are the cuts that I'm going to have to make to do it. So that one's going to be more conventional. But if you notice I've introduced curved edges. So this gets to a point where you need to sort of travel with the blade a bit more. And you can, in theory, you can use either blade for this. The one I'm going to use is my kind of in-between blade. So it's the slightly steeper sheep's foot. If you notice the main difference is at the tip here, this one's pointier than this one. So this is great for just pressing in. This one will turn a little bit and travel and it's slightly thicker in the spine. So it's got a slightly steeper bevel angle. So the first thing I'm gonna do is make those release cuts again. So poke the tip into the middle of the triangle, just where it needs to go. And then again, in the middle to the point, and then this next one's the tricky one because effectively this is where we've got to travel. So we're going to travel from the deepest point. I'm working in line with the grain. So as I'm coming through this middle line, I'm also gently allowing the blade to rise out of the cut. So it's cutting shallower and shallower right up until that point where it's barely in the wood at all. So we're deeper in the middle. It's really difficult to get this across on camera, but we're talking about the difference between a millimeter in the middle and probably a quarter of a millimeter on the edge. So it's difficult to perceive, but what I've done is basically broken again this bigger chip with the curved surfaces up into three individual sections. And while we're at it, I'll just do this more conventional shaped one with the same series of cuts. I'm just going to push down so we're deep in the middle. 
always spin the work around to work from a sensible and convenient angle. And again, work, I thought if I'm working on surface, that's starting to flex the spoon. So it might be worth just supporting that where we're putting pressure down on it. Don't want to break it at this point. Should be more than strong enough, but again, let's not go silly. So now we've put these three cuts in, we've got to do the release cuts. So in this case, you can kind of go at this any which way you like in terms of which one you make first. I tend to work towards the shallowest point as my exit point with this type of cut. So I'm going to put this deep small triangle cut in first and that chip's still attached but only just by some of the fibres deeper inside the wood. Then I'm going to come from this pointy end down that line and as I'm coming down that line that cut's getting very slightly deeper so I'm pushing the knife in a little bit deeper as I travel down towards there and again it should perceivably drop into place. Then the release cut in this case is going to come deeper first and then as I'm traveling I'm backing off the pressure which helps me to turn the knife in that curved cut and hopefully meet the point where I started with the other one. These are the type of cuts where you're almost certainly going to need to just gradually find your way to the correct depth but hopefully it's all going to lift out at some point in kind of one severed piece. So you see we've got those two chips have come out together so I'll cut slightly deeper but just creating that space with that initial cut gave the wood somewhere to kind of close up on itself and allow the knife some room to move within the wood itself. Just clean up that inside a bit. Now this one again doesn't really matter which way we come at it. I'm going to come across the grain here point to point just virtually pressing a little bit of travel um, and then I'm going to come up the side again just rock that into there so then the last cut here is going to be made with a slight curve again so I'm saving the curve cut for last and again I'm starting shallow pressing deep until we get to that point again we're just going to drop in to that first first cut that we made we didn't go quite deep enough on the outside here but there we go see there's a couple of chips now the beauty with triangles is they can quite easily nest into each other so you can get quite experimental with the designs and once you've got the hang of it you don't necessarily need to draw these extra lines in you can just make these with the knife so I'm just going to do one more for you so we can see the technique you can even take that chip out almost independently and then come up that line again deeper, easing off the pressure, getting shallower and shallower and shallower towards the point. Because there comes a point when you're working up against another chip, if you try and cut too deep in next to a chip, you're just going to blow out the wall between the two. So again, I'm going to come up the outside of this one first with a deeper cut, running into the shallower cut. So I'm putting a little bit less pressure into this side wall with this release cut, effectively because that's where it's its finest here. So then I'm going to work away from that fine point. So fairly shallow at the top, you can see the tips already lifting on that chip. Then as I come down, I've got to put a little bit more pressure, but not enough where I'm going to blow out into the surrounding chips and take out the dividing wall between them. Didn't quite hit the center there. So again, a little refining cut, just to remove that little chip out the middle. But there we go, hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea how we can progress. Once we've got a bit of con control of the basics, we can start exploring different design elements and stuff and just playing with it a little bit. The only other thing we might want to consider is in the likes of this one where we're taking the chips out of the side. Um, they're effectively just a V-notch and again present on here, but if you want to kind of define part of the handle, they're quite a good way of visually breaking it up. So what I would normally do for those is not even bother to draw them. I would just make one and any, yeah, any kind of blade will do. Small carving knife, even a full size carving knife you can use for this. So let's use 
let's use a full size one for this. So effectively, if you just kind of, we follow across the line at the bottom there, we're gonna drop down a couple of millimeters and I'm just gonna stand the knife up on its edge and just rock it to make a little mark, okay? And then if I just very gently, so that I don't mark the surface, roll the knife across in a straight line, I can mark the same point on the opposite side. And then effectively, we're just gonna come back from that a couple of millimeters, cut down towards that point, in towards that point, so that becomes the middle of the bottom of that chip. And the straighter part of a blade you use, we could make these cut with literally any of the knives that we've used, but the straighter part of the blade you use, the flatter you'll get into the bottom of that little V. And out they, out they pop. We can just refine them, widen them, deepen them. You can just keep going at it until you've got the definition that you want. But it, it can just help to break it up one section of the handle from another. You could put a series of them in, you could do little sweeping cuts in between them. So if we did another pair, so a bit lower down here, let's do one there, roll it across, one there, take the V's out again. And then what we can sometimes manage is if we come up to the tip of the knife, we could take maybe a little a little bow out in between that kind of works a little bit as a visual break just just you've got to roll the blade in and out of that cut so we don't blow the chips out again and just put those little little dents in effectively into the edge and the corner it breaks off the breaks off the sharp corner there and just adds that little decorative feature and really other than that, it's just a matter of taste and design and experience. You've got the basic building blocks there to work with. So the only other thing we want to have a quick look at is how we maintain the tools. So the last thing we're just going to quickly look at is the maintenance of these really fine blades. Um, the clip points, or the, the pointy detail knives, whichever way you look at it, are very similar to your standard carving knife in this shape. They've got a straight part of the blade, they've got a belly in the edge there. Um, so most of the time we're going to get away with maintaining them on a strop. If they get damaged we're obviously going to need to go back to coarser materials. So what I find is really useful for these small knives is these quite quite small portable little sharpening stones. There's several manufacturers out there on the market making them but they'll quite often have a diamond abrasive on one side and a ceramic on the on the flip side. So this is quite a fine diamond and an even finer ceramic. So we can use this to touch up and this doesn't need sharpening, so I'm just going to strop it. What's but the maker of that one there? This one is made by a company called Easy Lap. Um, I found them to be really good. I think they're imported from America by the looks of it, Carson City. Um, and I think the distributor for these is uh, Kronos Engineering, but I think they actually have their own website made up for Easy Lap. They're actually based in a, uh, a town just down the road called Dunstable, but most of their business, I think, is online. I've actually visited the place a couple of times because it's local enough. It's where I buy some of my tools still for making knives as well. So they're an engineering suppliers, but they do a massive range of um, this, these diamond stones. These ones are quite cool because they fold up within their handle and they've even got this little point on the end. So if you want to like, drill a little hole in your bench, you can keep it still by poking the end in and use it, use it however you want, basically. But they're really useful for keeping these knives in shape and they don't need to be huge obviously because they're only sharpening small blades but I wanted to point out when you have these clip point knives or anything with a really sharp point sometimes if you're just coming back on the strop to do the straight part of the blade the point is actually almost reversed I'm going to exaggerate there so if you change the angle or dig it in it's going to dig into your strop so the key is to skew the blade slightly put it on the strop and then make sure as you come away We'll deal with this potentially in another video and in fact we might have already looked at this a few years back. When you're putting pressure down, to do the straight part of the blade you just pull straight back. To come round this belly you also have to lift the handle slightly to maintain in contact with the bevel. So it's important to skew the knife very slightly, come back so we don't dig the point and as we come round skew it even more as we lift the handle and we've got the clearance just so that we don't 
drag big track marks into the strop, which will make it less effective. So same going back the other way. As I lift the handle, I'm making sure that point is trailing, basically, just so that we can maintain that without doing too much damage to the strop. And also blunting the tip of the knife, effectively start dragging it backwards through the strop. It's gonna knock the, at least, start to round the tip over and that we want to maintain that as sharp as we possibly can. You might need to pay special attention to the tip and just come in, put a bit of pressure down with a finger and just focus on that to maintain it. Okay, if it's more, if it needs more of a sharpen than that, you're obviously going to go back to previous grips. Now the other type of blade that we've been working with, these sheep's foots, this one could actually do with a little bit of a sharpen. So I'm going to start here on the diamond and what we want to try and make sure is that we hit the edge and what can be quite useful for that is just to apply a little bit of marker pen just so that we know when we've hit the edge let that dry for a second and then when we start working on this abrasive we want to basically, we're only really concerned with this section of the blade. This straight edge is going to be useful at some point as we wear it away, but really the first five to 10 millimeters is all we're potentially interested in for the time being. So I'm going to put pressure down with one finger and you can draw away or into the diamond. It doesn't matter which direction you travel. Um, I'm just going to prop this up properly. So I'm just putting pressure down exactly where I want it to be, backwards and forwards, and hopefully we'll see, we're not quite hit the tip yet. So I've held it slightly the wrong angle there. Because it's a flat surface, it's reasonably easy to maintain this. And so now we've hit all the way to the tip. Same coming back the other way, pressure down. And when you're looking to refine an edge like this, you basically want to abrade it until you can feel or see with you know the use of a bit of magnification, magnification, you might be able to see a slight burr start to form. But I can see now, just by the scratch pattern this is leaving, I haven't quite hit the tip, the tip's still very shiny on this side, so it's not quite as flat as it should be. So I'm just gonna carry on until I can see that scratch pattern. You're not really gonna see what's going on because I've got my finger right on the blade. And again, it's still looking a little bit shiny on the tip. So I don't want to stand the tip up and just start making a micro bevel at the tip. What I could try and do is maybe come in with more of a, a stabbing motion in from the edge of the stone. It gives me less chance to move things around. Same from this side. And try and use all of the stone. Don't focus on one particular area. So if you're going to do this, travel as you're doing it. And again, with the diamond, it's a hard surface, so we can work into the edge or away from the edge. Doesn't really make any difference. We're not likely to cut into the stone. If you're using Japanese water stones, they're a bit more of a friable material, so that we don't want to cut into them. So we'd always, you know, we could sharpen with a trailing edge very carefully. I normally, with these knives, to be honest, I normally stick with a trailing edge. It helps me to see if I'm forming a bit of a burr and it gets me used to the, the right muscle memory for stropping, which is probably the most important part of this. So I'm happy that we've abraded the edge as much as we need to on that stone now. I'm going to move on to the ceramic. And again, you should see a bit more evidence on this stone because it's a, a lighter coloured abrasive and it's a finer abrasive. What will happen is you leave a bit of a, a stain from the metal that's being removed. And even though it's a very fine abrasive and it's starting to polish the surface now, you can kind of see evidence that it is still removing some metal from these grey marks that are appearing. When this builds up too much, handy another tool, probably not the same one you're going to rub the wood down with, but I'm using the opposite end. Just a note, a pencil eraser will help to clean these up and get some of that kind of glazing off. You can also use a little bit of lubrication on these if you want. Just a little drop of water, doesn't hurt. But once we've, once we've got a satisfactory edge on the knife, we just want to refine it on the strop again. And because it's flat, again, we can just put some pressure down. I'm going to put that pressure down with a thumb just so you can see the point. And you can see there where I've hit some fresh abrasive. 
which is just a, a compound on the leather, very fine polishing compound. We're just going to go finger down, thumb down, just putting pressure on that bevel so we get it nice and sharp. And with all of these knives, if you ever do break the tip, which invariably is going to happen at some point, the easiest way to rectify it is not to try and sharpen the edge back until we've got a new tip. What I would normally do is try and set this up on a block of, a block of wood so we can just see the tip overhanging. And just basically, this is another diamond file. I just want to have enough of that showing so I can rub bits of the spine away until such time as I've restored the tip. With the, um, with the clip point, same sort of thing. We can just come in and again, rub the spine on the abrasive until we restore the satisfactory point without actually tampering with the, the edge geometry and the bevel angles. It's just a far quicker and more reliable way of, of repairing these type of knives and say, Sometimes you're going to just put a bit too much pressure and hit a bit of awkward timber and you're going to damage the tip. It's, that's why this knife is a lot shorter than it was when I got it. So that's the basic sharpening and maintenance routine for these. And I think that hopefully pretty much covers what we need to know about the basics of chip carving on spoons. So there you have it, my friends. That is a wrap for the chip carving tutorial, Lee. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Zed. That's the first time I've actually seen a detailed tutorial myself in full. Yeah. I've always caught little snippets here and there. I've seen you obviously teach at Greenwood working events. Yeah. Uh, but I've always caught snippets, you know, from the corner of my eye. Yeah. But in terms of the start to finish, that was the first time I've seen it in person. Cool. Yeah. Nice so it's broke down a few boundaries for people and explain the basics at least. Like I say, it can get way more complicated than that. You've seen some of the work that's yes, out there. Yeah. There's a guy on Instagram at the minute, I think his name's Per Noren. Probably said that wrong, but anyway, his work is just, it just blows your mind. Is that lady in Russia of. who does it as well? What's her oh, name? Oh, um, Tatiana. Is it Tatiana? I think, I think so, yeah, tap belt Tat carvings. Yeah, Tatiana yeah. carving or something. Yeah, she, yeah. again, some mind-blowing stuff, really. It's, what, what's possible is, is way beyond anything yeah. that we've shown today. But again, it's kind of like your experience and practice is the limit. Yeah. If you can come up with a design and use the correct tools, then actually, while we're talking about that, you've mentioned the lady's name. She inspired me to make this, which is kind of, a little bit closer it's a bit like the knife that she seems to use on her channel and it's like almost like a palette knife but she does incredible things of it and yeah i've tried working with it it's not for me exactly but i thought well i've got to have a go if it's yeah. the, if it, maybe, maybe it's the tools maybe oh, kudos not. to you for giving that a go though i thought i'd give it yeah, a try make yeah, it go she's got some special skills with that that, that type yeah of yeah yeah there's some amazing people out there with chip carving that take it to a whole different level yeah. like you said you look at it your eyes just go cross-eyed looking at their work you're like where does it start where does it begin because it's so intricate in terms of what they're doing but Lee, now seriously thank you so much as i stress at the beginning of this tutorial this tutorial is designed as a ground as a foundation you know to go through what we hope is covering all the important fundamentals of chip carving and the idea is, is obviously lee has demonstrated but obviously a a kind of sample piece as well as a spoon but the reality is you can just apply it to any form of green woodworking pretty much you yeah. know yeah. whatever you want to do i've seen people do some really funky stuff on cooks and bowls etc so the idea with this is hopefully we've covered all the fundamentals to kind of give you the confidence to go out there and give this a try now what i'm going to do i'm going to put a few links down below I'm going to put a link to uh, Lee's website and on there you can sign up to his email newsletter and find out a lot more about what he has going on. Also, I'm going to put a link below to Lee's Instagram and on that Instagram you can see a plethora of work over the recent years uh, of the myriad of things that he gets up to. He's very, very talented when it comes to the whole sphere of green woodworking as well as tool handling and tool making. So you'll be able to see that on his Instagram, the whole history there, should you not be aware of him already or not be connected to him. Uh, what we're going to be doing, this is more of a kind of long-term thing going into kind of the coming months and possibly even the next year, is we will gradually tentatively start covering different elements of kind of decoration techniques okay so um if you're not subscribed already to this channel make sure you hit the subscribe button and obviously you'll be staying tuned in terms of finding out more about when those videos come out also i have 
got a whole list of uh, tutorials covering green woodworking. And I'm gonna put a link below to that as well in the description and videos that I've done with Lee uh, previously. If you haven't done so already, we're actually in the process, we're actually in the, uh, on the middle of doing a ongoing series on sheaths for spoon knives. So that's a really well received series. So once again, a link to all the tutorials down below. So Lee, I really do appreciate your help once again. No you kind of allowing me into your abode My and form this tutorial. Guys, as always, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. From Lee Stoffer and myself, Sad Outdoors, peace out.